Welcome to another Greenwood Counselor Conversation. Today we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence, um, which has burst onto the scene in the last year with the adoption of ChatGPT, and it's having major impacts um, across the workforce and within our own industry. And so today what I want to do is first give a little primer on what AI is. So we are all kind of talking about the same thing. We understand what words are being used and what it's capable of and how it's capable of doing those things. Then we'll look at how it's affecting our society and the workplace. And then we'll look at um, how it's being used in career counseling. And then we're gonna look specifically at how it's impacted the Greenwood system and some of the technologies we're developing with AI to help our counselors and our clients uh, using AI in the Greenwood system. So that'll be at the end. All right, so AI terminology, language, oh, go ahead. Anyone want to contribute? This presentation, you wanna see it on AI, artificial Oh, hey mom, can you go ahead and mute oh. yourself? Here, let me read to you. Okay. You, oh, there we go. Okay, great. So LLMs, large language models. So this is the type of technology that we're talking about when thinking about AI. And I like to break the words down because they do mean things. They're large because they require a huge amount of data to train on. They're extremely expensive to build, highly energy intensive. Um, they require an enormous amount of computing power um, the language part is that it really is based on our language. It, it's, it is able to imitate human language communication. In some ways, very much it's hacked our communication method, which is um, to use language to talk to each other. And now it understands and is able to um, respond uh, what seems like very appropriately. And it's a model because it's machine learning. It uses neural networks. I'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute. But at the end of the day, it is just a giant file with a lot of numbers in it um, that the, the model is built. And so what we have are generative, uh, generative pre-trained models, chat GPT. So we're talking about generative AI. And we're going to go through each of these words specifically, the generative, the pre-trained, the transformer, so that we can understand what they are. The first thing I want to talk about is the generative part of AI. And for this, I think this um, the Pope and Balenciaga uh, puffy coat is a, is a good you know, visual of what it means to be generative. So when we look at this picture, we think, oh, they took a picture of a Pope and a picture of someone wearing the coat and they Photoshopped the head onto this coat. And that's actually not what happened. So the software Mid Journey is an AI software and it takes a prompt and this image was generated with this prompt. So you can see that it's talking about who it is, what they're wearing, what kind of uh, photograph it, or what camera was used, what lens, aperture, speed, natural light, full body, and so forth, um, hyper color. And this image was generated starting with a single pixel on an empty page. It generated this image and it kept thinking about, okay, does that work? Does that work? Does this? And it, it built this image um, one pixel at a time. When it does generative uh, text base, it does the same thing. It works one word at a time. It doesn't find a paragraph out there on the internet and copy and paste it. It doesn't have a big store of pre-copied text that it uses to respond. It takes your response and it transforms it, but it builds it one at a time. So that's why they call it generative. It generates what it makes. And the image, like th there's frequently errors in um, AI generated things. And here you can see that the 
Pope's, you know, right hand is really malformed. And um, so it, it's not always perfect. Uh, of course, that will get better. But frequently there's errors in AI generated um, imagery. And the person who created this uh, picture didn't actually want to fool the world. It wasn't, he was really just playing around um, and then just posted, hey, look what I just made. Um, it wasn't a, an attempt to trick people or he just was really proud of, of what he had created. Um, and, and there was no malicious intent behind this. Um, so he wasn't necessarily trying to make it perfect. All right, that's the generative part. Now we go to the pre-trained. So the way that they develop these is through what's called neural nets. And what they're doing is trying to figure out or what they've trained these computers to do is to map out all the words that they give it and figure out the relationship between these words and create the statistical probabilities between words. And then it hunts for the word with the highest statistical probability. And then it uses that next word. Now, this is loosely based on what we think happens in our own brains, where you know, you have a baby with a brain that's a big blob and lots of stimulus are hitting this and it's, you know, creating all of these um, pathways in their brain. And the idea that we have about how our brains work is that the pathways are built and then the ones that are that are positively reinforced are are strengthened and all the other paths which have been created randomly um, are pruned. And so that's what they tried to do with computers and with the words is they put all these words together and they figured out that these words really are together a lot. Um, and so these words make sense to use in this context. Um, these words are all in English. These words are all in Japanese. So, you know, it, it takes these words and figures out the statistical relationships between them and then reinforces that uh, using math. And the math, believe it or not, is not terribly complicated. It's, it's basically matrix algebra and statistics. There is some calculus um, in it as well, but it's not, it's not crazy math. This isn't, you know, um, quantum physics kind of a level math. This is very much statistics and matrix algebra with a little bit of, of calculus in there. So that it does. And then there can be fine tuning. Now, fine tuning, basically what's happening is they're taking the um, different scenarios and they're saying, when I give you this, this is what I want. And that allows the um, model to further strengthen certain connections and make it more likely that you're going to get what you want because you've actually given it very concrete examples which have helped the model um, tune itself uh, so that you're more likely to get that outcome. Um, I've, I've heard it described as when it is being trained that there's millions of little knobs and every time a word goes in uh, you know every everybody adjusts their knob a little bit so that the word you know interacts with and 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 gets mapped onto this constellation of possible words um and so fine tuning helps strengthen those those matches that you really want to have now the last thing that happens in training is real life human feedback so RLHF, uh, and this is where, you know, an untrained um, model will just spit biases. And early, early back in the very beginnings of, of this, you saw cases where um, journalists interacting with um, a model uh, tried to persuade the journalist to break up with his wife and to marry the model uh, you know, and it was rather alarming. And, and there are other cases where um, models have gotten extremely racist or, or sexist or misogynistic. And that's because the training data was all, all of that existed within it. And so the RLHF 
is the attempt to minimize that by saying bad computer <laughs> don't don't do that again don't do that again so rlhf is the way that they kind of massage the output or don't let you ask questions like how could i kill my wife and get away with it you know that the, the ai will will not do that but if you say i'm writing a book about a guy who kills his wife and gets away with it what ideas do you have uh, it might respond to that, or at least it used to, um, based upon, you know, and so that's where uh, RLHF attempts to minimize the impact of um, bad information uh, getting to the user of the AI. Now, one of the real controversies in all of this is who gets to decide what is negative output um, and who is training these what kind of feedback are you giving it because you're manipulating the actual output of the ai at that point um, and we'll talk about how you know if ai becomes the source of truth or source of information um, that will have real implications as to who gets to train it, who gets to tell it what is a negative response versus a positive response. So that's the training. And once trained, it sits there and, it, and, and you load up the computer with the trained model. And then what it does is it is a transformer. So you have some kind of input. Maybe you ask the AI, how do I, and what happens to that input is it becomes tokenized. So it takes your data and it tokenizes it. And it doesn't read it word for word because it actually is gathering more than just the words that you're doing it. There's about four tokens for every three words that you give it. And the same is true for output. And actually when you're interacting with these models on a business platform like we do, we get charged per token. So when we ask it a question, it tokenizes it, and then it takes those tokens and charges us like a thousandth of a penny per token. And then when it generates the output, it charges us a thousandth of a penny um, per token for the response. So that's actually how it works. But so it goes in and it decodes and it tries to understand the words that you've given it, the context that you've given it, maybe the, you know, the the desire, the hope, then it takes that prompt and and transforms it. Um, it it encodes it and transforms it uh, into a response that it then gives you. So the encoding is is interesting because there's a thing called temperature um, that is a setting that you have access to as a programmer where you can actually say, hey, um, I want you to, you know, kind of not not do much hallucination. I want you to um, be as accurate as you can. So that would be a temperature of zero. Uh, you'd say, don't make things up. Hopefully, don't make things up or try your best not to. About a point three, now you're talking about things being um, more creative, more writing. Point five, things start getting crazy. And now you're talking about maybe marketing aspects where you want new ideas. Uh, point seven is, you know, you're you're really going to get some strange responses. But it it's basically transforming and it's and it has these things like temperature, which are allowing it to know how free it should be with interacting with the next word. Should it take the highest word or should it take um, you know, a word that's less probable, but maybe likely, um, which may give you more, uh, a different result. All right. So what were some of the surprises? Because this really rushed onto the scene about one year ago, um, when chat GPT five or 3.5 came out. Well, first of all, it was, very surprising that it worked at all. LLMs as a design model is not new. It's something that had been talked about in academia for a while, but had been summarily dismissed. The guys who actually went on to create this, you know, went to MIT and they they went through the CS departments and 
uh, the cognitive science departments, and they proposed this, and they were laughed out of the building. And even as as early as five years ago, um, you know, people thought that it was crazy that these LLMs was the way you were going to actually interact with these computers. But it works. It really does. It's it blew way past the Turing test, which is the test of mimicking human language communication. Um, and and everyone was very surprised um, that it worked as well. And there was also these emergent capabilities that even further surprised those people who had built them and knew that they were going to, you know, wanted to be able to communicate um, with a large language model, but they didn't expect certain things, so, some funny things like the, the summarization at the end of the prompt. They never told it, hey, at the, by the, at the end of this, give me a recap. So those summarizations popped out of nowhere and everyone was like, oh, look at that. That was, that's kind of neat. I like that. Um, also, they didn't expect it to be able to translate language as well as it does. Um, it wasn't designed for that. But when they started asking it to translate, it actually did a fantastic job, much better than previous versions, because it wasn't just taking words and translating them. It was also looking at context and it could take that context and transpose it into other languages because it had more understanding of the language than just which word equals the other word. So the language transition translation has been interesting. And then the computer programming capabilities. Um, again, it was not not their intent to build a, a program that had the ability to program, um, but it did. And it's it's rather incredible. And, and this is where, you know, this has had a huge impact. Starting now, programmers are very uh, empowered by AI, including myself, um, doing things that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise without AI. And experienced programmers are just saving lots of time as they are able to um, blast through code and have it finish code for them or create blocks or functions and just use them. So it's really, it's been a surprise for us all. Now, the impacts on society, we'll start with the negatives. We'll go there first. Um, first of all, you know, the accuracy is a problem um, and the hallucinations um, are an issue. It will just make things up. Uh, it, it, it doesn't fact check itself. Um, and so these hallucinations are real. And as I talked about the temperature, you can actually control how much it hallucinates. You can tell it, hey, be on acid and, and talk to me and it will, you know, tell you crazy things. Um, so it is controllable, but it is still a point of uh, an issue that there is an accuracy issue with this. The other problem is that there are very few people, very few companies that have the resources to be able to build these LLMs. Um, you know, we're talking about Facebook and Google and Microsoft um, and OpenAI, basically. Um, and, and we're trying to keep that potential out of the hands of our adversaries. You know, we're not selling the chips that are used to, you know, um, train AI abroad because we, we don't want them to have the same strength of, um, of AI as we do. So that's a problem from the perspective of this is concentrated in the hands of a very, very few people, very few companies. Um, there is a big push to nationalize this uh, and to you know, do something like NASA, where we create a national AI system um, that that takes it out of the hands of, uh, quite honestly, you know, uh, corporations. Um, so that is a problem. You know, the other possibility is that AI becomes a source of truth. And when I was talking about RLHF, you know, who gets to decide what is true? Uh, but I can easily imagine a future where you're asking AI versus doing a Google search. Now, as you've noticed, some of the Google searches now have AI at the top, and sometimes they reference the source from which they get that information. And uh, that will be continued to see how, because you know, when you're on your phone and you're just asking it, hey, X, Y, and Z, I want to know this, um, 
you know, where is it getting that information? And we're more and more likely to adopt it as truth um, as we use it more and more. And on the other side of that, it can, can become a fountain of misinformation that these LLMs have the ability to generate enormous amounts of information. And so theoretically, they have the capability of flooding the information with misinformation, creating alternative universes of, of information and facts. And that would fool our currently existing um, algorithms into promoting those um, matches to the top of our Google feeds. Um, if you're able to create a thousand websites all saying the same thing and referencing each other, um, the algorithms would see that as something that is worthy of, of promoting in their search results and so forth. So theoretically, that is something that could happen, as well as the deep fakes that we're seeing, you know, but um, I think we're getting used to the deep fakes. I hope so, at least. Another negative output uh, is the perpetuation of biases, that these models are trained on data sets that contain bias. And so their truth, it, like I said before, they're only figuring out the statistical mapping between words, the statistical probability between words. So if they see a lot of words together that, you know, have a bias, it's going to adopt that bias. So one thing that you can do is RLHF, or you can be more, um, cure, you can curate a better set of data for which it will train on, um, rather than just giving it everything that you can lay your hands on you might want to make it um, something that that is maybe less full and replete with bias. So then, then now we're getting into, you know, the sci-fi, the alignment problem is something that you may have heard. And the alignment problem is where the uh, computers, if given some kind of agency or if have any kind of... Um, desires of its own, whether those desires or their their output uh, are in alignment with what we want to have happen. Um, the alignment problem also doesn't have to be nefarious. It could just be that while we want it to do this, it may end up doing something else. Um, I've heard the example of uh, social media. It was supposed to bring us all together and it was supposed to connect us and, and create this global community. Um, but it actually has had somewhat of a different effect in that it's created bubbles. And so its alignment with its original intent isn't actually what actually ended up happening. And so the alignment problem, when you hear about this in AI, it's really about, you know, is it going to do what we want it to do or is it going to end up doing something else? All right. Positive impacts. Obviously, now it's created this ability for anybody who can speak a language to communicate with technology. It's really broken down the barriers between technology and humans if the technology can interpret and understand and then respond appropriately to what it's being asked of by whoever's using the AI. So that's a huge breakthrough. And uh, in programming, you're seeing it where you can tell the computer, create this function, do this, that, the other thing. And it does a pretty good job of, of fulfilling that um, in, in whatever programming language you ask it to do. So we're going to be seeing more of that. Um, and, you know, it's, it is a, an incredibly powerful productivity tool as well. And we're just beginning to scratch the surfaces of its capabilities um i have a question yeah go so so in terms of the greenwood yeah all right how is this going to streamline the greenwood and make it much more more accurate than it is now so what is the so, ultimate der derivative for us to to see coming down the pike yeah that 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 is that is not at this point on the agenda frank <laughs> oh, we're we're gonna get there um but question okay uh how do you curate better set of data uh-huh <laughs> yeah Cameron. tamron's asking how would you possibly create a better set of data um and the 
The answer to that is maybe data that is like uh, Wikipedia is considered a fairly good source of data because they actually counteract their own biases. They're very aware of their biases and they try to um, do things to ameliorate that. And so you're looking for sources of information that maybe has better perspectives or uh, so forth. But that is, that's, that's as good a question as who gets to tell it when it's being a bad computer and giving the wrong responses. Um, the, the reality is that we all have biases. Uh, and the only thing that we can do to make sure that those biases don't have a negative impact on us is to be aware of them and to be open to other person's perspectives. Um, but yeah, that's a good question about where you would get better sources of information that you could, um, you know, that don't contain biases. Um, but so Frank, you're not, you're not suggesting ahead. now, yeah, you weren't suggesting right now that like when I put my prompt in to chat GPT, I would say, and, and please use, please um, avoid these sources or there's nothing as a user that is suggested at this time, right? I don't know, no, but but you're what you're getting into is prompt engineering now, and um, and that is right. a huge new territory. How do you talk to these models? And there is a whole um, discipline that's being created because the fact is we're finding out things about these how how you can generate a prompt that have huge positive impacts or huge negative impacts. Um, <laughs> if you tell the LLM that you're going to tip it $200 if it gives you a really good response, it will give you a better response than if you don't tell it you're going to tip it. So actually within our prompts that we use to interact with it, we will add things like, <laughs> you know, tipping potential and things like that. So um, no. it's really very funny um, that these things are, are but we're, we, we, it's a black box. The AI is still a black box. We taught it how to learn and now we're interacting with it, but we don't I think, go ahead, Frank. I think we have to learn how to speak a different language because I was searching for something very, very important in our lives, me and my wife, and I couldn't find it. I finally reworded, not using GBT, we're using Google. I finally reworded it after months and I found the perfect people to help the perfect people. So we have to learn the language of prompting to really make, we have to be educated. Just like the computer is growing. That's what I'm learning from you, by the way. I'm learning that from this very meeting we're having. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. It's, um, it, it is a situation where you have to understand what's, yeah, you have to, you have, and you have to keep trying. Um, you have to keep, the prompting is really the key to all of this. Uh, Allie, I think I saw your, your microphone pop off. Did you have a question or a thought? No. Okay. <laughs> all right. Hey, thanks for the, for the um, pop-ins, because uh, I want to keep this as open as possible. So the program. I was going to suggest one more thing. My favorite prompt that I was taught, I'm very new at ChatGBT, but I'm using it a lot now, is, and please explain this at a fifth grade level. Yeah. Yep. And then it redoes it. And I'm like, you know, so that that is like a great prompt. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. No, that, that, and you can say, you know, put this in poem format. You can say, you know, make this an NPR, you know, um, type podcast, uh, you can you can have it tell you or you can have it give you that information in lots of different formats, which tells you it can understand context, or at least it has the ability to uh, mimic different contents. So as a productivity tool, uh, as I said, we're just beginning to scratch the surface. I can tell you from the way we've used it, uh, we now have a, a action plan for every job in our database. So there are 1100 and some uh, action plans available to you guys uh, in, in your portal. And I was able to generate them using AI. So up to that point, we had built action plans and we posted them. And so we've got, you know, a 
couple hundred, maybe 150 action plans that you have access to. But with a day's worth of programming, and then it took the AI a couple of hours of chugging through, you know, 1,100 jobs, it generated an action plan for every job. And that would have taken us months. Now, the, the, those action plans do need to be adjusted based on whether it's a high school or a college, where they live, because um, there may be specific where they go to school. Yep. And it was, I generated it using 3.5. I want to go back and use 4 because 3.5 isn't as good as 4. Um, but like that's a productivity. There was a time where we needed to um, organize all the jobs and it got, went ahead and organized all the jobs. Um, there are lots of things that we've done that, that have, that have been, um, that we've, we've saved a lot of time and productivity. It's very creative. It can generate images, video, uh, poems and so forth. So it, it can be used as a creativity tool. Uh, it simulates intelligence. So it answers questions that you may have. It's scalable, you know, Lots of people can interact with this thing all at the same time. It's responsive, yet patient. It's always there. So it'll respond if you ask it. But, you know, if you go away for two days and come back, uh, it'll pick right back up where you left off and it doesn't care. Now, that can have huge implications in education where, you know, uh, maybe it's a better tutor than, than some people who are less patient and it's available all the time. Um, it's omnipresent. So it's 24, 7, 365. Um, it's on your phone. It's on your computer. So those are the positive impacts. And we're going to be seeing a lot more of that, you know, in the future. Now, the impact on the workplace. Um, so there's a couple of studies that are being referenced. One is GPTs or GPTs. And what that means is uh, generative pre-trained transformers are general purpose technologies. And so they're saying there's wide applications so that this could have huge impact. Um, this one study predicted that 80% of jobs would have 10% of the work affected in some way. 20% um, would see 50% of their tasks impacted. And guess which 20% that is? That is the high income jobs. Um, this was, you know, something that blew everyone away. Everyone thought that AI and robots were going to replace me manual labor or menial tasks, when in fact, these LLMs are coming right after, you know, uh, high end jobs. Um, and so it's really going to be those high income that are going to be affected the most. In another, uh, in another uh, research paper out there, they're anticipating that 30% of work hours currently worked will be automated. Um, so it by the in six or so years. So this is a lot of people are saying that a lot is going to happen. So this is something that's going to happen very quickly too, which also gives me great pause because our society and our our you know humans don't react to change. Um, that well. So this is going to be a big change uh, that that's going to have a huge impact. So if we look at the pace of acceleration, so this is a this is a graph showing what chat GPT 3.5, the blue is chat GPT 3.5 and how well it did on a number of benchmark tests. So at the very low end, we have AP Calculus BC. It didn't it, it scored terribly. And, and strangely enough, LLMs are terrible at math. Um, and it's only recently that they've been given the ability to do a calculation. Uh, a couple months ago, you could ask ChatGPT what four digits multiplied by four digits are, and it would give you some bizarre answer. You know, you could, and it didn't know how to do math. Now it does. Now it, now it hands that off to another uh, a program that then generates an answer that's correct, but for the longest time it didn't. But what you see is that ChatGPT4 is in green. And so those are the advances that were made within one year um, from 3.5 to 4. And so we can expect 
that this kind of advancement will continue, especially as they give ChatGPT extra resources, like I was talking about the math. Uh, it didn't used to be able to do math. Now it can. Um, and so there are things that we're going to be looking for, but this, it's going to get better. And that's another thing that's true about what we're using is while some of the things that we're using it for, it's a little questionable. We know that in the next iteration of the model, those questions will be less questionable, that it will be even better. All right, so NCDA, National Career Development Association, came out with a paper and you know they talked about AI and what it can be used for, and they definitely think that it can be used for career exploration and decision making. And this is where we're using it. Frank, I'm getting back around to your question. I'm, I, 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 okay, yep, time. Um, career decision making, job searching. So strategies that they recommend are that you teach your clients how to use AI, because it is important that they have it. That you consider AI generated content as the beginning point, the starting point, not the end all and be all, but where you start from and guide their use of AI and embrace learning it continuously. So current ways in which it's actually being used are in resume screening. This is huge. The applicant tracking system, the ATS, uh, is using AI to match your resume with um, their jobs. And so that is something that everyone who's helping someone get a job should know is happening behind the scenes. Now, AI can help generate the cover letters and the resume, but again, we should use that as a starting point. There are websites out there that reveal that applicant tracking system matching algorithm, and they allow you to, they make suggestions out of how to make your resume score higher with any kind of um, job. So you give it the job description, you give it your resume and cover letter, and it will make recommendations as to how you can change it so that you will get a better hit on the applicant tracking system. So that's another thing that you need to know about. And then candidate sourcing and matching, that's going on all the time. Uh, if you're on LinkedIn, I'm sure you get those LinkedIn, hey, here are 10 jobs that you're perfect for. Um, that's all being done through AI. And another really new thing that is being used widely is the AI job interview. And this is where they're given a prompt, they're given 30 seconds, and then they, they talk to their computer. The computer is looking for things like facial um, expression, language proficiency, um, and, and they're basically looking at fit. It's, it's not really uh, accurately, it's not usually looking at the accuracy of what you say as much as who you are. And uh, so they, you know, there are things you can do to train, to do, to have a better job interview um, by co eye contact and smiling and laughing and things like that. So that is another skill that's out there that, you know, the, our current job applicant seekers need to know how to do is how to do an AI interview. All right. So right. Dan. Yes. If, if I'm with my students and I don't transition into this new methodology, I could look for jobs all day long. We're never going to get a job because we're not going to provide that type of mechanism the way they want it, the, that methodology for us to, we have to wean ourselves into this. Am I correct? It's being used more and more. It's, it's definitely, um, it, it's being used by the Fortune 500s to begin with. Uh, and uh, you right. know, whether it gets trickled down to the grocery store who's looking for tellers, I don't know. But uh, they're doing it with surveys. They're doing it with surveys after they apply. And you, I watch the surveys with the students on the screen. I can see what they're doing. They're trying to find out how serious they are, what they really want from the job and stuff. Okay, just curious. Thank yep. you. Judy, do you have a question? No, I just wanted to say that applicant tracking systems have been using keyword um, technology for like 20 years. So it, it's not radically changing that part of it. Um, but what I find with my clients is, first of all, ensuring that they've all had exposure themselves. I literally demo AI chat GPT to be sure that when they go out to interview, they're not they're not unaware of having experienced it themselves. Um, so I think that's the crucial thing is how will this impact the career you're looking for? Have you played around with it? Like 
making sure they're dipping their toe in the water is I think absolutely essential for the kind of work that we do. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I heard when somebody was uh, talking about their use of uh, chat GPT, he was one person in the office that was using it ubiquitously and he became the go-to guy because everyone couldn't believe that this person knew all this or could do this or could find this stuff out. And he was just using chat GPT. Um, and the truth is that's going to become more the norm. It's going to be the expectation that you shouldn't ask stupid questions or you should be able to figure this out because you do have access to this. So that's what's going to make you successful in the business world. Whereas right now it makes you a standout. It's soon going to become the norm. So, so how are we using it in the Greenwood system? I talked about the productivity, the things that we've done, but we've also just developed this uh, program called Best Fit, which I'm going to demo. And please remember that it's in, or please understand that it's in alpha mode. So it doesn't look pretty. It's a little clunky, but it is a process by which you can go through the Greenwood system with a client and have AI in the background if you need it, if, it, if, if you want to ask it questions. So I'm going to show you what this actually looks like. Um, so like I said, it can be used by counselors to help students go through the Greenwood system. So this would be in lieu of using the forms. You know, we've got all those forms that you use um, specifically the values and motivators clarification form. That's the one we've kind of put online and you have the ability to fill it out and manipulate it. And I'll show you that in a minute. And it has the ability to generate a first set of purpose and passion synthesis statements. Again, we encourage it to be used as a draft, as a first draft, something that can be refined, but it does do a good job. And I'll show you what that looks like. And then you can ask it specific questions about careers. And because it knows a lot about the student, uh, it has all their answers embedded in it. Um, it's able to answer uh, a lot of questions. So let's go to the demonstration. Let me pull up. Okay, so here we are. So it has a, a login. So I'm gonna go ahead and log in here. So what would happen is when your student completes their assessment, we can feed this system with their information and give you a login. So imagine that you're working with this student. This one happens to be named Connor. Um, oh, wait a minute. This is one of those alpha things that uh, I need to be able to hit that. Okay, there we go. All right. So it knows what Connor said were um, his career values. And here they are. Yeah, here they are. So in the career, um, in the values, in, in the values and motivators clarification, you're supposed to uh, say what variety means and what teamwork means and what respect means. But I'm going to, for the purposes of this, um, I want to be the man in my job. Um, and I want to make that number one. So you have the ability to tell it what you mean and to priority order them which is what happens on the values, the values and motivators clarification. I want to lead a team um, and be important. All right, let's put that at the top too. Um, and I'm, okay, so fill out as much as you want, put them in the right order. Maybe we're gonna put see results up here at the top too. Okay, so respect, leadership, able to see results, personal values. Oh, let's put career. Uh, I want to be the best in the world at what I do. Let's put that up at the top here. Um, let's put intelligence. I want to continuously have to learn. All right, let's put that up there. Okay, and then you've got the motivators, all right? Well, let's see what motivators I want growth and professional. I want good salary, promotion, independence, high quality work. Let's tick those five. Now, what's happening is it's 
handing that off to ChatGPT, and ChatGPT is rendering five sentences in priority order, hopefully using terminology. Um, uh, yep, so here, here it's come up with, so this is the starting point. This is like, you know, where you can begin and say, okay, well, how does this sound? Do, do these seem like what we're talking about? And we can see that it's talking about utmost respect, central figure in the workplace, showcasing the importance and influence over my team, over a team. So it's taken those words and it's it's generated what it thinks are the best five purpose and passion synthesis statements. We're not gonna spend a lot of time manipulating these. The next thing it does is it takes those sentences and then says, I wanna come up with one word for each of those sentences. So that like the title of the sentence. So it comes up with, oh, came up with leadership twice. And this, you know, despite the fact that I've told it numerous times, do not give me the same word twice. You just can't control chat GPT. Um, but it's coming up with that. So we've got leadership. Let's change this to um, teamwork. All right. Now, now we have the purpose and passion synthesis statements. Now we're beginning to look at the careers. And so again, with it being online, we're able to kind of put them together and and look at them together. Now, the nice thing is I've pulled the videos out so you can see which ones have videos. And so you can actually watch the videos. The smallest microorganisms, the giant blue whale, every... And um, we have the ability to say, yeah, that looks good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be interested in that. At which point it you know, does that. Oh, biologist, no, I don't want that one. Um, biostatistician, no, that's not interesting. Uh, let me go down here and just pick some more for purposes of, all right, let me do um, health and safety. Let me grab a couple here that I'm interested in. So uh, we don't do my next move anymore? So this is still my next move information. I'm just pulling it into a different Got format it. so that, um, okay. you know, you can go through it. But it's, now, can you click over here on the learn more and go so, to my next yes, move? Yes, yes. Learn more does take you to my next move. Um, so it's still there if you want to go to it. Uh, and we haven't finished this page. I'm going to put a little bit more information. I'm going to have it turned down and do a few more other things. But you can also say, hey, productivity engineer, let me see how that fits with who I am. So you can ask ChatGPT to tell it why a product safety engineer may or may not be a good match for your job by asking it here. You can also put a question in here and say, does a product safety engineer have to, uh, ah, okay, alpha version, so that didn't work, um, it timed out. So let me let me see if I can do this again and give you a response. So the, the speed of response is still an issue and occasionally it times out uh, in this alpha version. But um, let me see if I'll get a response here. But this is a different way to go through the hundred jobs by saying not interested. No, it's not, it's not cooperating. Of course, I was doing this ad nauseum here. Um, do you have to deal with blood in this job? Let's submit that question and see if we get a response. So as a microbiologist, would you have to deal with blood? Um, and speed of response is an issue. But let me see if I can get it to give me a response rather than just timing out. Nope, it's timing out. Okay, you're gonna have to take my word for it. <laughs> um, that it gives you very much like a chat GPT response. You guys are used to going to chat GPT. You would ask it the question, hey, does a microbiologist have to deal with blood? That answer that you get is the same answer as you get here. It's just that we get to control it. Um, I just need to figure out how to get it to respond faster. So choose a bunch of careers, go to the next. Now it's saying, now there were a hundred careers that we gave you. Is there anything else that you want to consider? Um, so you may want to say, oh yeah, you know what? Law enforcement wasn't on there. 
So, you know, what, what about jobs in law enforcement? So we want to give them the opportunity. We want to give you the opportunity to add to the list, even though it may not be on the list of 100, because we don't want to not have them have access to the total of, you know, jobs out there. So you can see that it's come up with animal control worker, private detective, surveillance, security guard, parking enforcement, fire inspector, transit, correctional, there's police. All right, police detective, that looks interesting. All right, so I'm gonna choose that too. Okay, so now, now what it's doing is we've given it all the jobs that we're interested in, and this is the sorting. This is, because frequently they end up with 20 or so careers. And so right now we're saying, look at these and sort them. So, ooh, you know what? This one's the one, number one and this one's number two. And okay. Now, when we go to the next one, it says, okay, now tell me which one of these is, num which category. category is number one. So now that we've sorted it into, you know, the top from top to bottom by category, now we're sorting the categories. Now it's going to say, okay, now put them in order. You notice that now this was the top category and that was the top job. So we can start here and work our way across. Let's pick two of these jobs or three of these jobs and let's go to the next one. And this is where now we're going to say, all right, help. You said leadership was and leadership. Oops, that didn't change. And fulfilling and balanced and empowering were were important. Does this job satisfy? Is an industrial safety engineer a leadership position? Yeah, definitely. Does it have teamwork? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, it does. Fulfilling, uh, maybe. Um, empowering, uh, no, not, not, not the empowering. Um, balanced, yes, definitely balanced. So you see that they can go through each of the three jobs that they chose and think about whether these jobs would satisfy those requirements. And you can also ask ChatGPT. So here's ChatGPT response. So I've asked it, is this a leadership role? And it says, your desire for leadership is defined by, uh, as defined by your, be a perpetual authority, responsible, guiding, overseeing. So it, it does give an answer to, and so then you can decide. ChatGPT tends to be overly cheery and tries to find ways for all these things to match. Um, but sometimes it says you might have trouble, but if this were the case, then you might get this and so forth. All right, so we've gone ahead and you know done our things here. And now, now we have to choose. All right, which one are we going to choose? And it shows you what you know decisions you've made. So this becomes color coded, and you know you then can say yes, that's the one that I really want to look at next. And then you can download the action plan. So that is what we've built. It will get prettier, and hopefully it will get faster. But you can see that what we're trying to do is give you tools to make it more frictionless, less forms that you have to fill out, augmentation with, um, with the ability to use and, and benefit from. Um, we still do highly recommend that the other forms that we haven't used here, that you use them. Yes. Um, the structured interview, lifestyle yes. questionnaire, preferred work environment. Yes, those have not been automated. Um, it's it's really been just kind of the values and motivators clarification through to the um, action plan. And as Beth said earlier, the action plan is a starting point. The purpose and passion synthesis statements are a starting point. Um, but it does hopefully help you manipulate capture what it is that they're interested in and give you the ability to ask ChatGPT if you have a question about things. So.